Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Today we're getting right started at 1030. So as people will as they shuffle in and you at home, if you're tuning in, we have a special treat and a special message for you today. And we're getting ready to worship. How are you all doing? <laughs> all right, let's get started. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God forevermore. We He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds victory. Yeah, there is joy in the eyes of the Lord. Joy in the eyes of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. Joy God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, 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 now, oh, 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 oh. Well, we will sing to the God who heals. Sing to the God who saves. Sing to the God who always will make a way. When he hung upon the cross, he rose upon the grave. My God, he rolls the stones away. That's right. We won't be quiet. Come on. We won't be quiet. All right. How are y'all doing today? Everybody doing good? I didn't hear you. How are y'all doing today? All right. We aren't going to be quiet. We're going to worship our Lord today. You feel the spirits in here? You feel the spirit? You feel it? You feel it, Don? You feel it, right? So let's, uh, let's talk about the Holy Spirit, right? There's nothing more that will ever come close and nothing can compare to our living hope. In your presence. And we're in his presence right now. So that's, that's the beauty of all this. Why we come every Sunday to be in his presence. To hear the message. To hear the worship. But mostly to have him near us. We can take it out. Take him out with us. Out into the world. As we go into our, 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 our weekly world. But we can bring that experience of worship. Every day with us. And that feeling that you get as you sing. And I don't know about you guys, but when, I, when I'm worshiping, I get that feeling. Do you get that feeling? 
You feel it inside you? It's really great. To get a Holy Spirit. Nothing can compare to your living hope. Nothing can. In your presence, Lord, give yourself presence right now. And I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Thank you, Jesus. In your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and flood this place and feel the atmosphere i feel you your glory god is what my heart longs for to be overcome by your presence lord oh your presence Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Oh, your presence, oh God, your presence, Lord. Oh, your presence, Lord, fill your heart. Spirit, you're welcome here, right? Is he welcome here? Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere, right? What great words, right? Your glory, God, is what our heart longs for, to be overcome by your presence. I think it speaks to it. I think it talks about when we come in, and sometimes we're, we walk in the door and we're bankrupt. We've had a you, 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 you've had a disagreement with someone or you've, you, you had a bad day the night before or, or whatever, right? And we walk in here and Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Here's our atmosphere right here, right? Your glory, God, is what our heart longs for to be overcome by your presence. Great stuff, right? So there's m different ways of worshiping. You know, there's, there's fast songs, there's slow songs. And then there's glorious, 
right? Let's do it, Kerry. Come on. Hallelujah. I like that jump and shout and tell it like it is music. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's good to see all that are here and believing for all that are not in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you happy today? Are you happy today? You know, your life may not be going the way you exactly you want it, but we have a God that's with us always in whatever we do. He'll help us and guide us. Praise the Lord. Uh, where's that brother over here? Where is I heard him. I heard him shouting. Where is? Come, come here, brother Richard. Uh, brother Richard's got something to shout about. So, brother Richard had fourth stage cancer of the colon. That's kind of serious. And uh, so he went to the doctors and they did some work on him and uh, did a, what do they call that? A chemo and radiation and all that stuff. But what's the report now? Cancer free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Cancer free, hallelujah, by the stripes I've been healed. I've just been obedient to what the living word says. It says, delight yourself in me, and I'll give you the desires of your heart, and we serve a God that shall not lie. Amen. 
Glory to God. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. And while he was going through all that stuff, he still was up there doing the congas and helping us out. Even mowed the lawn uh, yesterday to help us out. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So we want to welcome everyone that's here today. And uh, we need to get some first-time visitors. I'm sure they'll be coming around the mountain when they come. Praise God. My, <laughs> my son's going to come and tell us some things that are happening. We have a busy October coming. All right. You ready for it? Are you ready for it, brother? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. All right. You ready? Well, hello, everyone. It's so good to see you all. I was just in with the elementary kids. I was telling them about our trip. I think my dad's got some pictures and, uh, 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 you know, to explain what we did. But we visited the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. So I was just able to talk to the kids. We had a viewfinder. They saw all the pictures. Um, so they were super excited. And they had all kinds of questions. Um, but today they're going to be learning about, in their Team Kid lesson, what about people who haven't trusted in Jesus? The kids will learn that God works through us to tell others about Jesus so they may be saved. This is our second week talking about that. And so just this week, pray as a family that you and your child will be courageous to share the gospel, all right? Um, and then I also wanted to give an update on AB 957. Remember, we'd been announcing and um, encouraging everyone to contact their state senators. Um, so unfortunately, it did pass the California state legislature. But Friday night, we got word that uh, Governor Newsom vetoed it. So it will not become law. So give all glory to God. Thank you for reaching out to your state senators. Um, so it's a great development. But we still don't know the outcome of AB 665. Um, we don't know. It's been presented to the governor. So if you could um, contact the governor um, on AB 665, you can uh, call either 916-445-2841, or you can contact him on his, on his website. It's govgov.ca.gov slash contact. Um, so you could just like write a message online and just send it to him. You can just do a um, you know, a search engine search for Governor Gavin Newsom, and you should be able to get to his website and hit contact and send him a message and say that you do not support AB 665 and you want him to veto that bill as well. Um, anyway, so our annual church picnic is coming up. S yep, Sunday, October 1st at 12 noon. We have 800 water balloons, a watermelon eating contest, volleyball for all, and a dual water slide. Can I see the slide, please? Will the real slide please stand up? Okay, um, so there is the water slide. Um, and just to let you know, there's a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to participate in the watermelon eating contest. Some people are like, no way, I don't want to participate. Some people are like very excited about it. I'm, one, I'm on the excited side. Um, we do still need some sign-ups for food. If you can sign up for potato salad, dessert, uh, water, and soft drinks, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and then the church will provide the chicken, and you can go sign up in the back uh, to bring a side. It's not required, but we really encourage it. Um, the King's Men's Breakfast is Saturday, October 7th at 9.30. The Point of Grace men are going to be joining us for breakfast and a basketball rema rematch. And my dad is speaking on We Are His Workmanship in Christ from Ephesians 2.10. My parents' 40th wedding anniversary is coming up on October 15th. 10.30. Uh, where they're going to be celebrating 40 years as man and wife, as it says in Ephesians 5.31. We're going to have a special slideshow presentation and reception, and my dad's sermon will be how to find and keep a godly spouse. So that's for all you singles. you got to find them. And for the marrieds, you got to keep them, okay? Um, women's Friday Night Freedom Talks, Friday, October 20th at 6.30. Uh, the lesson will be surrendering to and loving God more and more. If you can bring a healthy snack, we'd appreciate it. Not heavy. Last time, all the ladies were falling asleep after they had food. So a healthy snack, light. Um, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back, on the back table for ladies who want to join the fun. We also have Harvest Sunday coming up, Sunday, October 29th at 1030. We're going to have lunch, a chili cook-off, a Christian trunk or treat, a pie eating contest, and a cakewalk. What everyone loves, the cakewalk. I mean, when you win a cake, 
I mean, there's, there's like enough cakes for everybody to win, but when someone wins, they still feel like they won a million dollars. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and if you want to, optional, wear your best Western wear, you know, like cowboys, cowgirls. Um, and there's going to be a jumbo 20 feet by 20 feet jumper for everybody. So the adults can go in too. All right, can I see that? Okay, yeah, there, there, that's it right there. Uh, and then uh, remember Holy Spirit and Fire Weekly Prayer this Wednesday at 6.30 where we pray for our church, our community, and our nation. Um, then I wanted to say uh, we are uh, expanding. You know, we have our uh, services on Facebook and YouTube. Um, but, you know, over the last year, we've noticed that some of our views are being removed on YouTube. We're kind of seeing some content moderation, unfortunately. We thought, oh, we're small. They won't recognize us. But apparently... We've gotten someone's attention. So we really wanted to make sure that our services are on a free speech platform where there's no, we have no fear of reprisal, where everyone can access them, even if uh, the social media company does not agree with what we're saying. Um, and so we just want you to be aware of how to find us. We're now also uh, streaming on Rumble in addition to Facebook and YouTube. Um, so just that way, in case we get deplatformed as the election kind of moves forward, um, you can always uh, be able to find our services online. And you know what? You can watch it on your TV just like YouTube. You just download the Rumble app on your TV, and you just search for it just like YouTube. You can search for New Heart Foursquare Church, and you can find us that way. Or you can do it on your phone or tablet. Um, but we just wanted you to be aware of that, um, that we have that additional option for you. Uh, and then the last thing I just wanted to say, my sermon notes from last week, uh, we ran out. There's some additional ones on the back table in, like, the the clear holder with all the paper back there right as you exit. So if you weren't able to get uh, copies last week, uh, you can uh, get that this week. So anyway, that's it for me. Thanks so much, and I think we have the offering. Praise the Lord. Yes, we're going to worship the Lord in our giving, our tithes, and our offerings unto him. And it's a good thing to give to the Lord, is it not? We bless the Lord, O oh, our soul, and all that is within our pocketbooks. That's the way it works, isn't it? Something like that. And I found, I don't ever, I never, uh, I'm never embarrassed to ask people to give to God. Because I know God is faithful. He rewards us according to our giving. And even if you stretch, when you don't have, you stretch, God comes through and he stretches for you. I can remember a time when we didn't have much money and we continued to give. And they had a building program. How many of you like building programs? I don't really like them that much because you have to give more over and above what you normally give. But God then gives over and above and opens up doors that you didn't think could be open. And my wife, she had inherited some property, and it was, uh, it was a, a piece of land that was really not profitable. I mean, it had a bunch of trees. It had a slope. It had, was on a curve. There's no way that you could actually use this land. But it was blocking the rest of the inheritance. So what we did is we gave, believing God was going to give back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And the real estate agent called us and said, you know what? We just sold your property. I go, how did you do that? He says, well, a company was using it for a write-off, and so they bought the property, and so we got the money, and it opened up all the doorways. So when you give, know that God's going to open up doors for you to receive blessings that you didn't know that you could get in your way, but in his way, it can happen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege and opportunity to worship you, to give to you, to honor you, and we thank you that you give back and honor us in all of our dealings, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, and all agreed said, amen. Father, I 
condition You see I had a plan from the start Your son for redemption The price for my heart I don't have a contest for that kind and I can't comprehend and no one knows that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my soul needs a friend so I run to the Father again again and again again and again oh oh, 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 oh. again Praise the Lord. We do have a Father in heaven that loves us, cares for us, watching over us, amen, and we run to him, amen. We don't shy away. We have a problem, or even if we've done something wrong, we run to the Father, amen. Receive that. Receive that spirit of the Father in you right now. Know that he loves you, cares for you. He desires to have fellowship with you. What a great God, that he cares for us. What is man that you are mindful of us, that you would cause us to have fellowship with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I just feel the Spirit of the Lord is here. So let's just take time to acknowledge Him, worship Him. Let Him speak to your heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to the King. Glory to the King. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Say nice things to the Lord. Tell Him how much you love Him. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen.
I know my earthly father, he would give me anything I wanted. He always asked me, what do you need, son? What do you need? And the father's the same way. What do you need, son? What do you need, daughter? Praise the Lord. Now, I'm glad you're all here. We were vacationing Monday through Friday in a place called Kentucky to view the replica of Noah's Ark. And Ark is, yeah, an Ark. <laughs> Let's see it, Lord Jean. Let's see what it looks like. There it is. Amen. Now, that's a big boat, isn't it? Actually, it's not really a boat. It's a box or a chest to put animals in. And there, how many animals were there? 6,744 projected animals that were in the ark. Isn't that amazing how God took care of us? Now, that is uh, one and a half football fields long, Don. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, 51 feet, which is four to five uh, stories high, 30 yards wide. And we went through all of it, every three floors, and saw the great things. Let's see us. Uh, there we are. Hey, amen. So we were really there. It's not just a backdrop, but we were really there. And we, you know, it's a funny thing. We were in Kentucky, and we could not find a non-Christian. Everybody there was Christian. I mean, wherever we went, in the airport, in the restaurants, where even, even in the bar in the airport, the guy was Christian. I was so frustrated. I go, <laughs> I, can't, I don't get to minister. But anyway, it worked out fine. And we met some friends there. See? Can you see them in the back there? Yeah, they're just... They're just wood-framed people, but that's how big the ark is. And then here's a view inside the ark, looking up. A lot of, um, a lot of just, uh, it took 1,000 uh, wood makers to make this ark. It took two years. It took Noah 75 years. Can you imagine that? But the art, the uh, craftsmanship and the workmanship is just beautiful. And then before, I mean, after that, we went to the Creation Museum, uh, which is the largest one in the world. And they talked about uh, creation, how it came about, and all the things. That, and they even talked about Jesus and during the time, the Roman times. It was, it was just very enriching. And we saw, now Ashley had to school me on this. It's not a dinosaur. It's a mastodon. Is that how you say it? Mastodon. Which is like an uh, elephant. And I should have known because there's the trunk right there. And um, I didn't touch it because it says, do not touch. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to write it, but it's not going to work. So I'm excited today to have to introduce to you uh, Dr. Ryan Montague. Uh, actually, uh, Rudy and Gina introduced him to us in a Bible study that he was doing. He was working at APU for 10 years, decided to go out on his own and minister to those roundabout in churches. And so we're so glad to have him with us. So let's welcome Dr. Ryan Montague. Hey, well, it's awesome to, to be here with you all. Uh, so blessed to, to be invited and have the opportunity to share and see some familiar faces. It's also a, a good morning and, and kind of a new experience from here. I, I had a, a first this morning, which was that um, before I spake, uh, spoke, a, even a single word, Veronica came up and, and bought uh, both books and both stickers, which is unheard of. Normally, you walk into a space, and they're like, we're going to see how this goes, and then we're going to decide if we want to even remotely check out this book or any of this situation back here. So we all need some Veronicas in our lives that are willing to have the confidence, see the vision, and act. Amen? So I'm going to open up with a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right into things. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. I thank you for this church. I thank you for this, this fellowship and all the believers that attend, that faithfully pray, that serve the house of the Lord. And Lord, we just pray and, and ask you for, for more of your wisdom, your revelation, and your spirit, God. So Lord, continue to bless this day and allow us to walk by faith and not by feelings, to walk by truth and not by lies, and to be led by your spirit and not our flesh. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, well, this morning I get to share on a topic that's really near and dear to me, which is this idea of, of a kingdom mindset and a renewing of your mind. And this is a process that God has done an amazing work in me uh, over the last several years and given me some, some great insight around 
as he's been leading me and growing me and, and, and truly bringing me in this path of, of a renewing of the mind. Because I grew up, uh, you know, lukewarm Catholic, went to Catholic Mass every single Sunday, went to, you know, the, the Catholic grade school through eighth grade, you know, kind of went and checked all the boxes, but somehow really missed the, the relationship, the connection, and the renewing of the mind. And so even in my early uh, 20s, even though I was in Mass every single Sunday, still found myself living according to the patterns of the world and caught up in the, the mindset of the world with the, with the goals and the desires and the hopes and dreams of the world rather than of the kingdom of God. And so if you want to open with me, we're going to go to Romans 12 too. And this is going to be kind of the central scripture, although I'm going to bounce around and cover a lot of different scripture throughout our time here this morning. But that's going to be the main one that really guides and, and drives the focus for us here this morning. And it's Romans 12, too. But while you're flipping there, I'll just kind of share this, I, this mindset, your mindset, what that is, if you're not really familiar. It's your whole of attitudes, beliefs, and values. So your whole attitudes, beliefs, and values of a person makes up your, your mindset or perhaps your worldview or whatever you want to call it. But it's really the, the central mode by which you think and perceive and interact with the world. And so this is part of our mind and why it's so important when we read Romans 12 too. And it says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So as we engage with this today, to realize that do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. What is it? Well, that's the, the expectations of this world. The things that, that, the, that the culture puts on us. It's essentially saying like the, the world has a version of what a well-lived life looks like. It has a measuring stick of what it means to have a well-lived life according to the patterns of the world. But God's saying do not be conformed to those patterns because you're not of this world. Is that you can be in it but not of it. And that he wants to do a renewing of your mind. That when we come to Christ and we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. That he wants to completely renew our mind because we've spent however many decades being raised in the patterns of the world. Being raised in the thinking of the world. And our emotions have even been trained in that of the world. And he has to do a complete, and that's why Jesus calls for us to be born again. It's, it's, it is so important to actually be born again. Because... You have to actually leave the things of this world and be born into a new family with a new identity and a new spirit and a new heart and a new mind. Otherwise, you're going to continue to try to follow Christ while also still following the world. And how many people can attest that that just doesn't work? It falls flat. It leaves you with a lack of rest, with a lack of peace, and with a restless spirit. And so this is this this call to go all in with Jesus Christ from the top of our head to the tip of our toes and everything that we have. Because I really, as I've kind of looked at my own personal journey and also looked at the walks of the people around me, I've realized that the biggest issue for a Christian is being trapped in a worldly outlook, a worldly mindset. And it takes radical devotion to God to actually renew your mind because the things that have been hardwired from our family of origin, from our family and friends, from our high schools and perhaps colleges and workplaces and the media and the arts, the shows, the music. I mean, the, the patterns of this world are so abundant and so per persuasive and pervasive that it's just coming at us 24-7. So in order to, to experience a renewing of the mind and maintain that renewing of the mind, it takes ridiculous focus on the kingdom of heaven and getting our eyes set on the sights of the realities of heaven, not the things of earth. Because one of the things that stood out to me was in, in Matthew 16, 23, is that Jesus, this is where Jesus turns and rebukes Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. And in the New Living Translation, it said, for you're a dangerous trap to me. And a couple of years ago, that really stood out to me. And, and so I wanted to know, okay, well, what is Satan's dangerous trap? And Jesus says, you're a dangerous trap to me for you're merely seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. And so the Satan's dangerous trap is to get our minds so fixated on the things of this world that we're merely seeing ourselves, other people, our work, our calling, our purpose, merely through a human point of view and not from God's point of view. And we completely miss the bigger thing. 
because people continue to live for themselves and live uh, according to the ways of the world, which in, in Proverbs 14, 12, it says there's a way that seems right to a person, but it leads to death. And that's why so many have continued to pursue the things that seem right in this world, but then they have all the anxiety, all the depression, all the stress, all the worry, all the strife, and they're never truly set free and wondering why this whole Christianity thing doesn't work. Because they haven't gone all in, and they haven't fully surrendered, and they still have one foot in and one foot out. I kind of refer to it as like the hokey pokey Christian, where you got one foot in and you got one foot out. And I lived that way, and I've been there, and I've done that, and it doesn't work, and it just leaves you at a total lack of peace. And, and so part of this is really speaking from this place of, uh, even I came across, a, I get this Voice of Martyrs magazine, which uh, really shares these stories of persecuted Christians around the world. And one of them was this man, Peter Yasek, who is a, from the Czech Republic. And he was going around and ministering to people and helping, you know, lead discipleship groups and share Bibles. And he ended up getting imprisoned and arrested and imprisoned with ISIS in a Sudanese prison. And he was there in this prison for 445 days. And he had actually had received a lifetime sentence. The judge had, had issued him a lifetime sentence in the Sudanese prison. And he thought all, all things were lost and it was going to be completely hopeless. And then God totally did a miracle and, and they ended up rescuing him and brought him out of this prison. And when he came out, he said these words. He said, Lord, God, thank you. You saved me from a lifetime sentence in prison. The rest of my life is yours. And when I thought about, yeah, amen. And when I thought about that is that, you know, obviously most of us are never going to find ourselves in that situation. But when you think about the patterns of the world, the expectations of the world, you know, I grew up in an expectation of the world, whereas, you know, you, you know, go th going through high school, playing sports, you know, achieving awards, grades, so you can get into a good college, and then when you get into that good college, you do that so you can get a good job, and then when you get the good job, you then go for the promotions, and you go for the, you know, reward of a house, and all these sorts of things, and, and it was this endless cycle that I eventually realized that it's just this dangling carrot that you never actually get. As I pursued and ended up with a master's degree and a PhD and, and just going through all the motions of the things of this world only to realize like, oh, dang, like I never actually get the carrot. As soon as you get close to that carrot, it just gets moved further out. And now you got to do this and now you got to do that. And, it's, and it was this realization, this, this connection with Peter Yasek, what he was saying was, it was, for me, it was, God, thank you for you have saved me from a lifetime sentence from the patterns of this world. And you have brought me out. The rest of my life is yours. And so this is why it's so vitally important for us to really understand what it means to have a kingdom mindset. And so there's seven principles that I've really kind of thought about and prayed about and sought the Lord after that really helps us seal our, our fate with a kingdom mindset so that we don't go back to the things of old. Because there's so much scripture that says you must cling to the truth. You must remain steadfast. You must you know, hold firm. You must not drift away. You must practice the truth. Is that the reason for that scripture is because it's not easy. Is that many of you have been following the Lord for years on end, decades, and you can attest that the patterns of the world keep coming. The things of the world, the fights, the struggles, the, the, the issues, the spiritual attacks, they keep coming. So you have to truly embed yourself with bedrock anchoring principles to be able to remain steadfast in the power of God with a renewed mind and a sense of hope day in and day out so that you can truly wake up with the good news on your heart and ready to live it out before others. Amen? Amen. So up first is the very first principle is that it's about knowing it's about intimately knowing Christ. It's about intimately knowing Christ. It's intimacy with Christ. Is that you can, as I can attest to you from my own life, is you can show up week after week, Sunday after Sunday, and attend a religious service, but never get a relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that it's about intimately knowing him. In John 17, 3, it says, Now this is the way to eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is the way to eternal life, to know him personally. Is that many of the parents can attest is that you wanted so badly for your children, you raised them in the faith and you brought them up. 
But then eventually they have to make the choice for themselves. You eventually, they, they have their own free will to be able to choose intimacy with Christ and to continue to press in personally or to drift away. And it's that intimate knowledge of, of Christ. And in John 15, 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide, Christ abiding in us and us abiding in Christ is intimacy. It's, pers- cur- it's that personal close connection. Is that nobody can do that for you. Nobody can show up and, and personally abide with Christ on your behalf. They can plead in prayer and petition for you on your behalf, but they can't bring the intimacy with, with Christ for you. They can pray that for you, but they can't bring it to you. You have to actually draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so it's all about that intimacy. And then this is where Christ says it's this, this intimacy and, and we get no, I mean, the kind of alarming vision of this is in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, where Jesus says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. So it's this idea, you cannot be a hypocrite where you're saying one thing and then doing another. Is that our lives have to be in unity, in harmony with Christ. We have to be seeking the Lord in his light, but also living in the light. Rather than seeking the Lord in his light, but living in the darkness. And we can even do the, the right things of casting out demons in his name, prophesying in his name, performing many miracles in his name. But if we don't know him, he'll say, get away from me, for I never knew you. We have to actually have intimacy with God rather than just going through the motions, rather than being too busy for intimacy with, with, with Christ. Is that that busyness and the rush of life and the to-do list and all the distractions of all the shows you got to keep up with, is that that's what's so sad is that there's, you know, even well-intentioned Christians that I know that they've a, a whole laundry list of shows that they're keeping up with, that they've got recorded, that they got to go home and make sure that they watch, or they got to, you know, jump on this and listen to these podcasts or listen to this person, and they never actually get alone and hear from the Lord himself. And they're just getting numbed out, but then they show up for things, but they're showing up without the intimacy. And they're leaving without the intimacy. And the intimacy is absolutely everything. And so that's the first and foremost place is that the, the kingdom mindset comes from intimacy, personal knowledge and experience with the Lord. Number two is this, that it's about getting your value, worth, and dignity from God, not people, possessions, or status. That it's about getting your value, worth, and dignity from God. And the way that this happens is that, again, as so much of, of us have experienced that, of, of trying to re- seek value, to seek our worth in this world by the accomplishments, whether they be academically or they be uh, in, in, in the sports field or they be through the, the, the arts or music or work, is that we're constantly trying to prove ourselves to other people that we bring value to this space rather than knowing that we have value that supersedes anything that we could ever do, that we could ever ever achieve on our own. And that's where we get these verses of Genesis 127. Where does your value come from? Well, it comes from the fact that we were made in the image of God. And because of that, we have innate value that comes from him. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, Paul writes, pleading with people. He says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for you were bought, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. In 1 Corinthians 7, 23, again it says, God paid a high price for you, so do not be enslaved by the world. Is that when you look at your value, when you want to understand your value, You have to look to Jesus Christ on the cross. That that's where our value is the most plain and laid out for us and straightforward was that Jesus Christ, the son of a living God, 
came and lived and died for every single one of us. And that's where we realize that that's where our value is. Because the price that was paid was a pure and holy son of God. That was the price. That's the value that God saw on your life. Is that it wasn't bulls and goats. It wasn't doves and pigeons of the Old Testament. It was Jesus Christ to really drive home. This is the value that's placed on your life. And it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But we can all read that and, and see that, but it's so hard to believe it for ourselves. There's a reason that, that Paul says, don't you realize? Pleading with people. He didn't, he didn't, if, if, he, if it was that easy to, to, to understand, to believe, and so many can believe it for another person but not believe it for themselves. And then they go out seeking value, worth, and dignity from people, from a relationship. That's why people get in unhealthy relationships and the whole sorts. And it's also being able to simply say that it is well with my soul. When we have value, worth, and dignity in God, that's where we get that contentment where we can say, it is well with my soul. Rather than, again, so many, again, this whole kingdom mindset thing, the reason it's so passionate and on my heart is because there's so few Christians truly walking with a kingdom mindset. Because for so many, it is well with my soul when I'm feeling fit and looking good. When my posts are getting attention and likes. <clears throat> it is well with my soul when I have a completely checked off to-do list. When I have the position or title I deserve. The house is neat and tidy and in order. Then it is well with my soul. When my GPA is 3.5 or higher, it is well with my soul. When I'm able to do things perfectly. When I get that promotion. When I'm fixing others, other people's problems then it is well with my soul. But we have to get that value, worth, and dignity from God and God alone. And so we have to be so careful. That leads us to number three. Number three is this. That we have the same spirit in us that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. We have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. This is Romans 8.11. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Again, that's another scripture that it's easy to be like, wow, that's awesome, and then fly right by it and miss the whole point. And so it's one of those things where it's, we can look at it and say, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in, in you, lives in me. And be like, well, but I gotta run, I gotta run, I gotta run errands. Oh man, the gas tank's empty. And gas is six dollars a gallon. And, you know, oh man, but my boss, my boss is a knucklehead and he's still, you know, texting me for after work hours for things. And we completely lose out on the, but you have the same spirit in you that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. So what does any of those things have to do? I, like that puts everything into perspective when you realize that you have the same spirit in you that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. And one of the things that helped me was I heard this sermon from Reinhard Bonnke, who is a German-born evangelist to Africa. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And he said, so many people, they always want to feel the Holy Spirit. And if they, they don't feel the Holy Spirit, then they think the Holy Spirit's gone. God has abandoned them, and they're all, all alone and all by themselves. And he, he likened it to this. He said, the Holy Spirit, he said, it's just like a, a millionaire. A millionaire doesn't carry a million dollars on them at every single point in time. They don't carry their millions with them so they can feel the millions. They don't always feel all of that, but they always have access to it. And that's the same way with the Holy Spirit, and that was so refreshing for me. Because I just felt like these mighty men and women of God, they just always just walked in the spirit with all this feeling and knowing that the spirit of God, and it's like, no, that's not normal. Like, yes, that happens from time to time, but people aren't just walking around constantly, 100% of the time, feeling the spirit of God. But they always, it's so important to realize we always have access to the Holy Spirit. 
So he's always just a breath away, one word away, calling him in and partnering and renewing our strength within him. For it is not by force, not by strength, but by his spirit, says the Lord. And so that's an important one. So those first three, that it's about intimacy with God. It's about intimacy with Christ. It's about getting your value, worth, and dignity from him. And it's about knowing that you have the same spirit in you that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. Those three things produce a powerful personal walk and personal testimony with God that sets you free from the patterns of the world, the expectations of people, and sets you above and beyond anything that could come against you. And then it sets you up for these next four principles. And number four is this, that it's about God's kingdom, not your kingdom. And this is something that I missed for, again, for decades. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God. The patterns of this world make it about seeking your kingdom, making it about your will and your ways and your desires and expanding your personal space and, and getting that nicer home or that nicer car, nicer clothes, nicer things, and it becomes all about our kingdom rather than about God's kingdom when we completely miss the point. As in Philippians 1.27, you must live as citizens of heaven. It's so important to realize that conducting yourselves in the manner worthy of the good news about Christ and the biggest thing here is there's a warning for us in Psalm 39, 4 through 7. And, and 39, 4 through 7. Hold on one second. I'm just keeping tabs on the, on the clock here. Is that Psalm 39, 4 through 7 says this. This is a psalm from David. He says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered. How fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. There's a sobering realization that we are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Is it for myself and for so many? It was about the, the pursuit of the things of, of my kingdom, and it created this busyness and this to-do list and these list of accomplishments and list of things that I wanted to, to do or you know, make my mark or have an impact or whatever that means to people when you're not doing that totally in, in unity with Christ. But it's this realization that when you're doing that, you're merely moving in shadows. If it's done for you, it's merely moving shadows. Or as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, it's even worse than that. If, you've, if it's done without love, then you're nothing more than a clanging gong and a noisy cymbal. And it's worse than moving shadows. But, it's, but it rushes and it leads to nothing when it's about you and it's about your kingdom and it's about your ways. And so it's this realization which then ties in with number five, which is that it's about God's will, not your will. It's about God's will, not your will. And this, this goes hand in hand with it's about God's kingdom, not yours. It's about God's will, not yours. And this comes, again, Matthew 6.10. Even just in the, the Our Father prayer that Jesus gives us, he says, May your kingdom come, Lord. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But so many of my prayers was praying up to, to the Father in heaven about my kingdom coming to fruition, about my will being done. And then a few years ago, I saw this, this kind of meme that was being shared on, on social media. And it said, if all of your prayers were answered, would it change the world or just yours? And that really cut me to the core of just realizing that if, if all of my prayers were answered, it was pretty much just going to change my world and maybe my immediate family's world. And that was about it. Because it was, you know, it was a self-serving approach to God. Not realizing that what God had said was that when, when Jesus said, he said, come follow me and I will show you how to be fishers of men. Come follow me, and I will show you what is blessed. 
But for so long, in my kind of, kind of lukewarm faith and walk with God, it was all about turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, why don't you come follow me, and I'll show you what I need blessed. Because I need this blessed. I need this blessed. I need this person cast out for sure. Um, <laughs> And it was all just surveying my life about what I needed God to do for me and to bring my kingdom, to bring my will, to bring my ways, and falling short of missing it and completely missing it and realizing that this isn't about me. This is about Christ, that there's a bigger, higher calling, purpose in this life. And then while I've been striving and going after all these things, all I've done is been moving shadows and completely missed it. And it leads to nothing. But when you go about God's will and, and his ways, it completely changes everything. Because we have to step back and realize that for so many, especially you know, teaching at the college level, the, the big question is, what does God want me to do with my life? What's God's will for my life? And, and it's all this seeking of what's God's will for my life. But really, they're seeking God's plans for their life. Because we already know God gives us, in the Bible, he gives us his will for our lives. And we see this. What God's general will is for our lives is to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Which, when you stop and think about it, is ridiculously insane. <laughs> like, what would somebody's life look like if they actually loved the Lord their God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? Everything about them, every fiber of their being was just about loving God and then the second greatest commandment, to love others, to love your neighbors. Like that person's life would be ridiculously fruitful and attractive, and they would never have a shortage of, of friends or people in association and close uh, seeking of them because of the outpouring. That even in 1 John 2, 6, it says, those that say that they live in God ought to walk as Jesus walked. Like, that's, the love, that's, that's God's will for our life. To be holy as he is holy, he says, is his will for our life. To always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances. That's God's will for our life. To go and make disciples and baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the commands that he has given us. That's God's will for our life. Yet we're like, nah, yeah, 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 no, I mean, I got that, but like, what do you want me to do for work? Like, who do, you want me to, who do you want me to date? Who do you want me to marry? Where do you want me to live? What kind of car do you want me to buy? And we start just completely avoiding all that, and we seek God's specific will, and we, the, the, the specific will of what God wants to do with me specifically. And what we've done in our culture is we've flipped it upside down, and we seek God's specific will for us as individuals without having fully devoted ourselves to God's general will and when we avoid God's general will, we arrive at our specific will, lacking the character and the integrity and the stamina and the love and the humility to be able to handle and receive his specific will, which is his blessing for each and every one of us. And instead, we arrive there not having that character and what was meant to be a blessing now becomes a curse because we've tried to step into something that's too bigger than our character, because we have failed to, to be able to surrender ourselves, to be refined by Christ, to be able to be prepared to walk in his ways over here. Imagine what the, what the kingdom of God would look like currently in our day and age if people prayed as much about God's general will and seeking to become more and more like Christ from one degree of glory to another as much as they pray about what God wants them to do specifically for their life at every corner and every turn and every decision. It'd be so crazy and so radical to see the way people would walk, the way people would talk, actually living like Jesus if it was about God's will, not our will. So as you're doing that too, it's so important to realize that as we seek God's will, it won't necessarily change what you do, but it will most definitely change why you do it how you do it, and at what pace you do it. And yes, there are certain things that we are doing, or maybe even jobs that we're in places that we are, that it will change that completely. But other times, he'll say, hey, continue, just as Paul writes, continue as you were, but now with a new why, a new how, and a new pace by which you do that. And then that leads us to number six, which is that it's about eternal life, not this life. And we read about John 17, 3 earlier that now this is the way to eternal life. 
Notice that this is the way to eternal life. Again, from my own personal walk, the three things that I missed, the, you know, well, I missed all of these. But when you kind of bring them together, the first three of that it's about intimacy with Christ. That it's about getting your value from him. And then it's also this idea of the, that the kingdom of God. It's about God's kingdom. It's about God's will. And it's about eternal life, not this life. Where I made it about my kingdom, my will, and this life. All the comforts of this life. And the things of, of this life. And that's huge to, to know that because when you have your, your, your sights set on the realities of heaven, when you make it now about eternal life, that one of my friends, uh, Kurt Vernon, he said he was praying one time and he said he was praying to God, God, help me to change the world. And he felt like God spoke to him and said, I want you to pray bigger than that. And he's like, how do you pray bigger than like change the world? <laughs> he's like, I thought I went straight to the top. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to pray to change the occupancy of heaven. Like, stop and think about that. Like, our calling as Christians, what we're called to partner with and engage in, is literally changing the occupancy of heaven. One of my favorite songs right now is I Thank God by Maverick City and with Dante Bo. And part of that is, is, is this line in that song where it says, hell lost another one. Like, hell lost another one. Heaven gained another one. But I mean, like, but uh, career-wise, like, I needed a meaningful and important career. Like, should I be a dentist? Should I be a lawyer? It's like, no, you get to change the occupancy of heaven. Like, how do you, clearly we have missed that. Like, when we're so eager to focus on our work and our career as that being our place of meaning and significance and value, it just indicates that we have completely lost sight of the true meaning and purpose and the highest calling, which is that we get to work with God to change the occupancy of hell and, and from heaven, from hell to heaven and to move people from hell to heaven. And it's like there is no greater calling on our lives, and yet then we abandon that and we, we push that to the side because that seems so ridiculous that, that God would ever use me. And Probably the saddest thing that we're going to realize is that most people just don't even feel worthy to participate in this. Because they're still hung up on their, their own life and seeing themselves merely from a point of view, not from God's point of view. One of the most powerful ways I heard it put was from a pastor at our church just a few weeks ago. He said that, that, that God treats Christ as if he lived our lives. And yet he treats us as if we lived Jesus' life. Like, that's how you have to see yourself in order to know that you're, 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 none of us are worthy. That's the whole point, that my, none of us would be able to boast. And so we could actually all receive because none of us are worthy. And because of that, we are humble servants to the Most High God because none of us were worthy to, to earn it and to be puffed up and prideful. And so then we walk in this calling and people... You don't feel like they're worthy to participate, worthy to accept this, worthy to receive his love, worthy to receive his forgiveness. And so what are they doing? They're still walking in sin. They're still walking in unforgiveness. They're still walking from a deficit of love. They're still walking with the identity of the world rather than realizing that you have a new identity in Christ. You're a part of a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people, God's very own possession, the son or daughter of God. And as this guy Dan Muller put, he says, you know, nobody ever, you know, told me that, they told me that, that Christ died for me because I was a sinner. And he's like, yes, that's true, but nobody ever told me that, that the reason, he didn't die for me because I was a sinner, he died for me because I was a lost son with a destiny. Like, it's a big identity shift when we start to realize these things that God has in store for us. And when we have this idea of eternity in mind, now it brings a complete Different approach to pain, to suffering, to sickness, to disease. All the hardship that we face now is completely flipped on its head when we view things in light of eternity rather than just this merely this life. Because if your eyes are set and focused on this life, then pain, suffering, sickness, disease, hardships, all these things, broken relationships, all that stuff is going to be, it's going to grow in its influence and magnitude in your life. But when you have your eyes set on, on eternity, that's where it puts all that stuff into perspective. 
And then I'm called to walk with a testimony in every single area of this. So that's such a huge, important factor to be able to catch as we, as we live this way. And that was one that, even during the pandemic, is that I went, more to the, I went to the hospital more during the pandemic than I had my whole previous life uh, combined. Through, I had like five different staph infections and just all sorts of different stuff. And then every other month I was going back to Kaiser in Baldwin Park. Like, here we go again. And, but it changed. The, the, what God was showing to me in that season was that I would pray for healing. And, in, and if, it, if I wasn't getting healing, like the first, like in staph infection, I mean, it was, I prayed for healing, gave it, <laughs> gave it a day, gave it two days, gave it as long as I could before I was going to be in serious trouble. And then realized, okay, if God's not healing me and he's sending me to the hospital, then he's sending me there on a mission. And he's sending, them, sending me there for a divine appointment. Somebody there needs prayer. Somebody there needs encouragement. And so every single time I was going to the hospital, I was just praying, God, who are you sending me here to touch? Who are you sending me here to pray for? Who are you sending me here to encourage? And so it changed my walk. Rather than most people getting sick and injured, now everybody, everybody pray for me. I need help. And then I'm here. Everybody serve me while I'm here at the hospital. It completely, this kind of mindset flips everything over, and you realize, like, no, okay, if, if I'm going here, then I'm going here on a mission. I'm going here on a purpose. And I was. I was able to pray for, you know, doctors and nurses and people that were bringing food and, and people standing in line and people waiting in the urgent care with me. And it became this process of just having these eyes to see because it was set on the, 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 the sites of eternity. And so this is the last one, number seven. Number seven is it's about having one common enemy, not many. It's about having one common enemy, not many. And this is huge for kind of closing out our kingdom mindset. That in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18, it says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you may be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Amen? So we're not fighting against... Flesh and blood enemies. What that's saying is, is people are not your problem. People are not your enemies. They're deceived by the enemy. They're lost sons and daughters. What this does with, I, don't, I have one common enemy, not many, is that we realize that with, with Satan, God actually gave us a gift of one common enemy. That's why, unfortunately, just even in our own culture, in our own country, like it's going to take a massive outside threat and enemy to unite us all. But if there was a massive outside threat and our country was under attack and being bombarded and bombed and, and, and blown to smithereens, you better believe, as Americans, we're all going to be united in that moment. All hands on deck, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter who you voted for, we're under attack by one common enemy, and we got to come together. Otherwise, a house divided will not stand. And so that's this idea of we have one common enemy. So then we realize, and, God, and, and Jesus gave us the gift of being able to step into this through forgiveness, is that so many people have so many enemies because they have unforgiveness towards them. They have resentments. They have bitterness. They have withholding towards people, which the enemy loves. He loves unforgiveness. Because it's one of the most common themes amongst Christians is unforgiveness. And it's one of the most direct acts of disobedience we could have against God. When you are in unforgiveness towards somebody, you are in active disobedience to God. Because he says to forgive others as I have forgiven you. The Our Father prayer, Father, forgive me of my sins as I forgive others who have sinned against me. That that's the place where peace and unity comes from is through forgiveness. And so when we have any level of unforgiveness or bitterness or jadedness towards anybody or any group of people, then we're in direct violation of one of the, the commands of God. 
And the enemy loves that. So he wants you to feel like you're pitted against this person at work, this person in your family, this person in your neighborhood, these people in this political tribe. Whatever it is, you have to realize that they are not my enemy. They may be deceived, but we have to say, as Jesus did, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As this guy Dan Muller says, if you think about the person you have the biggest problems and issues with, if that person understood who they were in Christ and started thinking, acting, and behaving from a place of Christ's likeness, all of your problems with them would immediately cease to exist. So the only reason you have a problem with them is because they don't know who they are. They've lost their identity. And they need an actual believer who has intimacy with Christ, who has their value, worth, and dignity from God, who's pursuing the things of God to be able to stand firm and remain steadfast in their identity and to say, I'm not going to be tricked or baited into this, this argument. You know, I'm not going to be tricked or baited into your anger. I'm not going to be tricked or baited into this level of deceit and join you in that and give up my freedom, give up my position in Christ for this. For this. I'm going to remain steadfast and firm, and I'm going to show you peace and grace and mercy and patience and kindness and goodness, the fruit of the Spirit, because you're not going to drag me down. And when I do that, I'm calling you in because I know that you have an identity within that needs to be drawn out by a faithful believer that knows their identity. And that's this, this position that we can come from. Because there's three questions that I ask in any misunderstanding or conflict. Am I deceived? Are they deceived? Are we both deceived? So we've got to understand that we can, we can be drawn into deception and lose our firm footing, lose our grounding. But this idea of we have one common enemy, not many, it changes everything. Because then people are just deceived. And it's, it's cured me of ever uttering, oh, you know, calling anybody an idiot or calling anybody, you know, a loser or calling anybody a jerk. It's just they're deceived. So it's so easy to look at people in different political parties and be like, oh, you know, those losers, those, those crazy people, those this or that and the other thing. And get into name calling and realize, no, the only name you should call them is deceived or lost sons and daughters. But it completely flips and changes your perspective and your approach with them when you realize that they are simply deceived, lost sons and daughters. Now all of a sudden your approach changes radically. And one of the things that my wife and I have even learned just in, in parenting, we took a, a parenting course where we got one perspective that flipped our identity, which is that they said that your son or your child isn't giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. And I would apply that to just all people in general. People in general aren't giving you a hard time. They're, they're having a hard time. And when you approach people that way, whether it's the crazy driver on the highway, whether it's the you know, rude barista that may be spitting your, your coffee while you weren't looking, you know, whatever. It's, they're deceived. They're hurting. And so I'm not going to take any of this personally. Because what happens when we become insecure Christians, we take everything personally. And then we have many enemies. And we have a victimhood rather than no enemies and complete forgiveness and a clear conscience. And so this is so, so huge that hurt people hurt people. When we can realize this, this these seven principles set us up for absolute success in the kingdom of God. And so we've got to be able to, to realize what is setting us free. And so that's part of this, these seven things that, that I, it's about intimacy with Christ that's going to motivate this. That it's about getting your value and understanding your value in God. Realizing that you have the same spirit in you that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. That it's about God's kingdom, not your kingdom. That it's about God's will, not your will. And then it, it, it's this idea that we have one common enemy, not many. It seals us, it roots us, and it deeply plants us in this identity in Christ that's unshakable Never to be baited and tempted and drawn out, but to be able to walk in love and, and, and live in love that produces change in other people's lives and leads them to Christ and changes the occupancy of heaven. So with that kind of a mindset, you can wake up every single day deeply in love with God, deeply in love with people, and if you want to be pissed off at anybody, be pissed off at the devil. 
That's the kind of spirit and attitude we can bring to any given day when we are able to set our sights on the realities of heaven, not the things of earth. And we avoid Satan's dangerous trap of merely seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's point of view, when we do that. And so I just want to close with this, and it's a, it's a call for, for, for perhaps, and in, in for some of us, it, it's, a, it's a call for repentance. That out of those seven things, I know that I fell way short. I mean, there's a reason why I've gotten to those seven and why God's transformed my heart in that. Because I completely missed it. And if you're somebody that's, that has heard those seven, and there's even just one that you're like, yeah, I'm falling short in that area right now. Then this is a time, and the worship team is just going to play, play a song in the background. But I want this to be a call to action. A time where we actually take action to repent and turn to God. For the kingdom of heaven is near. And we don't have time to waste in unforgiveness. We don't have time to waste continuing to seek our own kingdom and our own will. We don't have time to waste in walking in anything less than your God-given value. And the freedom from people. And the freedom from expectations. And in the power of love. So today... This morning, if that's you, if there's even just one principle that you've fallen short, let alone perhaps all seven, then during this song, come forward for prayer. I brought some anointing oil here. Like, I, I, came, I came for transformation and change. I didn't come to play. I didn't come to just give a good talk. Because in 1 Corinthians 4.20, it says that the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk. It's living by God's power. And this is the time to move from talk to power. And there's power in coming forward, leave, getting up from your seat, walking forward. Whether that just to, to be to, to kneel, to sit, to stand, but to say, here I am, Lord. I repent. I have missed the mark in this area. And I want you to renew my mind right here, right now. And I want to leave here transformed because I want to walk in freedom. I want to walk in peace. I want to walk in love. And I want to experience divine appointments. And I want to experience the miracles. And I want to prophesy. But most importantly, I want to know you. I want to know you more. And that's the beauty of repentance. Is that it actually allows us to know God more. More deeply, more powerfully, more transformatively than anything else. So when we withhold our repentance, we withhold the transformation. So I'm going to pray, and then I just invite you up, and, and Pastor Chuck and others are going to come up here and help pray as well uh, for people that come forward, and, and we're going to go from there. We've got some anointing oil. If you just want to come and get alone on your own, you're welcome to do that. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray over this house of New Heart Church, Lord, that we would have new hearts, new minds in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for producing in us a sensitivity to your spirit to your draw, to your nearness, to your will, to your kingdom, and to your ways, God. Let today be a day where we can be changed and transformed through the renewing of our mind, putting off the old and putting on the new that you have in store. So let the people's repentance and confession be one of purpose, of deep transformation and movement forward in the obedience to your spirit right now that's prompting them, that's convicting them, let it produce an action of walking forward in repentance with a softened heart, a humble spirit, and allow you to do only what you can do, which is to clear the air, that our sins are forgiven or cast as far as the east is from the west, that you leave us with a clear conscience, that you leave us washed as white as snow. Lord, every single person that's coming forward, may they be washed as white as snow. Let them speak out of that place of repentance. Speak out the, the, the kingdom mindset principle that they've fallen short. Let them bring that before you, God. And you're going to do a movement in their heart that right now, even the Spirit of God continue to fill them with greater levels from the top of their head to the tip of their toes. That this would be one of those moments where they feel the tangible presence of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance.
Jesus, have your way. Jesus, have your way. We surrender it all to you, Jesus. Every fiber of our being, every thought in our mind, every word out of our mouth, every work of our hands, every cry of our heart, every desire from within, let it be surrendered to you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.